We open in a rundown bar where it's established that this rich, beautiful woman named Natasha is good at pool and enjoys betting against men and beating them. Though this is the first time she's been at this particular bar. There's one bar in every minute. We find out all this as a guy named Gabe enters and asks the barkeep about her. She came in about uh, 10 minutes after the mortician. She's been playing kiss and pay ever since. Hey, hey Gabe, uh, you religious or something? Nah, just cautious. Hmm, she's good with balls, har har. So Gabe offers to play her opponent next, who is an undertaker. I got the next set. Um, match. Oh, I got the next one. $20 a game. Without money, pool's just a stick and some balls. That's what I like about it. Yeah, no need for me to make any more lewd jokes. The episode pretty much does it for me. Ow! Anyway, he ends up cutting his finger. Let me see. Yeah, I think we know where this is going. Very sweet. Like clover blossom, honey. Forgot to take his insulin that day, I guess. So Gabe ends up losing to The Undertaker twice, losing $40, and The Undertaker will only play him again for 100 and he accepts for 200 Rack him up, my dear. This won't take long. So yeah, Gabe is one of the pool sharks that the title refers to and beats the shit out of this guy. All that awkwardness in the beginning was an act. You know that hike you were talking about? I think it's time you took it. You want a schedule or something? I have only one rule. I insist on being cozy in bed before the sun comes up. Otherwise, I'm quite flexible. Yeah, I'll bet you are. But I should be mad at you, you know. You stole my mark. Oh. Anyway, it turns out that Natasha knew that Gabe was a hustler, but she let him have that guy. Let's just say that I have a weakness for men with steel blue eyes. So now he tries to make a bet with her. I'll tell you what, if you win, you keep the 20. If I win, we'll figure out a way to work it out. Don't hustle a hustler, she says. You want to play pool for my body? For me? Would you do the same thing? I'll agree if you will. No money in the line, just us. You win, you get me. And if I win, I get you. Sounds like a win-win. Oops, turns out she's a vampire. So the games begin and naturally it's close. He starts asking her questions like where she learned to play, where she's from, etc. And then he asks her if she's been to a specific bar. You been to a little bar named Pinky's? Nice little pool table in the back, right outside Allentown. I really wouldn't remember. And it leads to a story about a guy who disappeared from that bar about a month ago. Everybody in town thought he ran off with her, except his family. And most likely ended up dead. But how could a woman just make a man disappear? If that's not exactly what this man wanted. Oof, negative implications there, and I don't just mean the possible murder. So she's about to go to the ladies' room and asks him to rack up five balls. While she's gone, he brings out a specific cue that he brought with him that he's been hiding and uses the chalk to draw a cross on the eight ball. Meanwhile, Natasha puts the barkeep to sleep. Yeah, it's about to get serious now. Okay, I don't think that's how the cross thing works with vampires, but points for creativity. Gabe mentions how his brother taught him how to do a specific trick shot and indicates that she knows who he is. How would I know about your brother? I was telling you about him before, don't you remember? He was playing pool at Pinky's Bar outside of Allentown. And then he disappeared. And he makes the shot. Next ball wins it. You're in trouble now. Am I? Stupid, sexy Natasha. Oh yeah, remember that cross? Take that thing off. That's gonna come up again later. Um, it, it's 6 a.m., Countess. Your bed is all made up and time is getting short. Big surprise that the guy she was playing against earlier turns out to be someone who works for her. And it turns out that she remembers Gabe's brother after all. Good pool player. And in the end, a divinely sumptuous treat. It also turns out that Gabe has been tracking her, which isn't too surprising at this point. Town here or town there, I find another missing person. It's too many deaths, Natasha. Once more, notice the cross. Either way, she ends up winning. <laughs> well, that's quite the magic eight ball. The game's not over. 
She reaches into that hole and <gasps> there's that cross again. That was pretty clever. It could have been blissful for you, but now it will be more painful than you can possibly imagine. He asks her why she uses pool to lure her victims. We need an invitation. Our prey must invite us to take them. Thus the bet. That fits with the typical vampire lore pretty nicely, actually. I find it stimulating. The panic a Mark feels the moment he realizes just what it is he's lost. Yeah, like a shark with the smell of blood in the water. Well, I still got the eight ball right here. She tries to distract him again, but he makes the shot by looking in the mirror where naturally he can't see her. You're the best I've ever seen. 50 points. It's over. So now he can do whatever he wants with her, so... <gasps> this one's for Bobby. <laughs> He's like, new plan, leg it! After having finally avenged his brother, Gabe has one more drink before heading out. We see that Natasha has turned to Ash, and I am more amused than I should be at the two little hills where her boobs were. <laughs> and so ends Pool Sharks. You know, when I hear a name like Pool Sharks as an episode for a show called Monsters, I imagine something like the Lone Shark in Buffy. Remember that guy? He was literally an anthropomorphic shark in a suit. I love that guy. So I was a little disappointed to realize that this was an episode about a vampire who plays pool. <laughs> Honestly though, it's not bad. It's a bit of a slow burn for better or for worse, but it's got kind of a film noir feel to it and it's kind of fun. These two actors have chemistry and they make this episode work. I like how it's like a game of chess where they're constantly trying to outmove each other. Gabe was played by Tom Mason, who was mostly a character actor but ended up as a regular on Party of Five. Natasha was played by Rebecca Downs, who is also mostly a character actor, but she's done a lot of voice work, including the Warcraft games. I thought that was interesting. This episode was written and directed by Alan Kingsberg, who, okay, was a writer on Winx Club of all things, a couple of Pokemon series. What's with Monsters writers ending up doing well-known animated shows? Is this gonna be a trend? <laughs> and also five episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark? That one makes a little more sense. Pool Sharks isn't bad, but it's a very simple and straightforward story, so it's hard to think of very much to say about it. So again, have another episode. So this guy is Miles Magus, a famous horror author who apparently uses his fame to pick up chicks. And somehow it works. Keep your books in your bedroom. I, I do all my work here. You want a beer? I didn't know you wrote Curse of the Mutilated. Curse of the Mutilated. Gotta love some of these book titles. I never met a really famous writer before. I'm just like everybody else. No. You're nice. And it's lucky we met. I can't tell if this guy is a bad actor or if he's being creepy and off putting on purpose. I think you're incredibly beautiful and wonderful and terrific. Um, thanks? <laughs> anyway, he leads her to the bed in the weirdest and creepiest way possible. I have an aching void in my life. I think you're the only person in the world right now that could fill it. I don't know how this woman doesn't see like 500 red flags right now. Got a thing for Angora there, Edward? back on the bed. What are you doing? I'm oh, just pulling the sheets down. Oh. I don't want to get them wrinkled. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't end well for this poor stupid girl. <laughs> Seriously, this scene is actually quite disturbing. <laughs> I promised I'd feed you tonight. Kudos to the creators for not having it belch. So sometime later, he brings another fan home. Wow. Mange mon cerveau in French. Eat my brains out. Death tongue in German is Totenzungen. How neat. Seriously, I love these titles. I really like you a lot, Vicky. 
As soon as I saw you at the buffet table eating shrimp, I wanted to ask you up for a drink. Oh my god, this guy. I know he's supposed to be famous, but how are women not completely turned off after talking to him for two minutes? I think you're incredibly beautiful and wonderful and terrific. Uh, look, uh, Miles. So this lady isn't as dumb as the last one and kind of knows something is up with him, but doesn't necessarily seem to think it's something bad. And there's something going on behind your eyes, some kind of inner secret life that really excites me. Now she gets nosy and pulls a half-typed page out of the typewriter and reads it. The unfulfilled desire breaking over my head like a tidal wave of blood. How rude. Don't you know how hard it's going to be to get that back in there and line it up just right? How many times have I tried to run away, but always the master calls me back to offer another sacrifice at his cruel altar? Apparently he's been writing about his experience with the bed, and she ends up finding an entire manuscript about it. Can it be any weirder than I drink your skin or <laughs> scream of the tortured? I wonder if he also wrote the script for die screaming with sharp things in your head. Anyway, she starts reading out loud and we get a bit of backstory. For some time now, I have been enslaved by a hideous alien creature. A strange psychological bond keeps me prisoner. Apparently he found the bed in an old abandoned house. I think your water bed is springing a leak. Okay, this bit's kind of funny. Ha ha ha! The cleaning lady was looking for her shoes last week. That was a very sitcom -y moment. Anyway, she asks for a beer and he goes to get them and finds her missing when he comes back. And of course she took the manuscript with her. Later that night he talks to the bed. People would come here and separate us. You wouldn't like that. I like that it talks back. Apparently he gets his book ideas from the creature's dreams in return for feeding it. I'll find her. <laughs> or she can just call you. She's fascinated about what she's read in the manuscript and invites him to come over, which he does. All right, where is it? Do you think it's gonna answer? <laughs> anyway, he just starts looking for it while she tells him how much she liked it. She says she can relate to it, which is interesting. ...insane love, a longing to escape, combined with a hopeless submission to the master. Only in my things, the main character is a young girl, and the master is a handsome English nobleman. Eventually, she suggests that they collaborate on making a publishable book out of it. He seems to like that idea. I was curious about your hero. Where will he end up? I don't know. The story isn't finished. She asks him why the character doesn't try to get away from the master, but he says that the character can't. He needs the master. But maybe he could find another relationship. A different kind. She talks him into spending the night, which he seems to be into. Whatever you want. Or maybe he's just biding his time until he can feed her to his bed. You know what's missing in your book? Your character never runs into anyone else who has a master like his own. Because there's only one master. But isn't that odd? If there's one of them, there's bound to be others. Well, that's an interesting thing to say. <laughs> nope, just a normal bed. The master's very old. We get some more backstory here. Apparently his bed is an ancient creature. The master remembers the dinosaurs. Did the bed lure dinosaurs on it? I like the image of a velociraptor going, hmm, that looks comfy. Oh no, ah! Anyway, apparently his bed is the last of its kind. And how does your hero know this? Because the master tells him. And maybe the master lies. Now he's the one missing all the red flags. Everything he says is true, because he is the truth. I'm sorry. I guess I take my work a little seriously sometimes. You think? The way you talk about that stuff, it seems so real to you, like you didn't make it up. What can I do to make everything all right? Anyway, she asks him to get her a beer. That's kind of a running theme in this episode, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think we knew that was coming. Though this death is a bit more comical than that first one. You're right, Miles. Probably wouldn't have worked out. And so ends Pillow Talk. 
This episode was alright. My biggest complaint is how blatantly creepy Miles is, and I just don't believe for a second that any woman wouldn't find him repulsive. I guess that's why they had the first lady be so dumb, where Vicky knew what she was doing, possibly from the beginning. But apparently he does this sort of thing a lot, and I just find it hard to believe that he'd be able to lure women into his home this easily. And I feel like the episode is trying to be campy on purpose, and maybe that's supposed to be part of the joke, but it still kind of bugs me. That said, while it's not that original of an idea, I think the concept of a bed that eats people is a neat gimmick, and like I said, that first death is pretty horrific. But other than that, while it's got kind of a silly charm to it, it's basically a just okay episode. By the way, here's a random interesting fact. There's a version of this episode on YouTube that is missing all of the music and a lot of the sound effects. There! I promised I'd feed you tonight. Which was apparently recorded off of Chiller, so apparently that channel got an unfinished version of the episode somehow. Miles was played by John Deal, who was a regular on Miami Vice and ended up being a regular on The Shield. It was written by David O'Dell, who has a short but interesting resume, including the live-action He-Man movie, Supergirl, The Dark Crystal, and The Muppet Show. That's about all I have to say about this one. It's alright, it has its moments, but it's not that great. Next up is Rouse Him Not. See you then. I never would have met my mess. What's that? It must have been that uh, cheap, fizzy champagne the publisher buys.